Secure Financial Advisors, a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full informed investment decision. This is your money, your wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMV. Now, here's Joe Anderson and Big Al Clopine. Hey, welcome back to the show. Show's called Your Money or Wealth. Joe Anderson, Big Al. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, happy New Year, right? So, middle of January already. Big news. Wednesday is uh, D Day. D Day, huh? My mother, Ruthie. <laughs> oh, okay, that D Day. It's coming again. Okay. So for, it's her winter trip. These years are, are, usually are extended. It's awful. Because I love well, my mother with you, all my heart. You know what, though? In, in defense of she Ruth, stays for Ruthie, months. Now. I know, but she lives in Minnesota. Where she, this is her summer home. I mean, this is her winter home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And my house home. is now. <laughs> I'm moving back in with my mother. Why did you get a home with extra bedrooms? I don't know why. That was the problem. Well, no, I mean, I had a one-bedroom condo at one point. Yeah, yeah she still came. Yeah, I had to sleep on the, the couch. <laughs> she, <laughs> I know you can't have your mom sleep on the yeah. couch. Ruthie, get on the couch. So now that you have a bedroom, there's no guilt. She just comes and oh, says, she's well, got her own room. Does she make dinner for you? No. Um, no? Well, no, I don't get home until like 10 o'clock at night. Yeah, I suppose. Right? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. It'd be, yeah, so it's one, one-way one ticket. One-way ticket. One-way ticket. You never know how long it's going to be. So it's like, yeah. really? So now I don't even ask how long she's going to stay. <laughs> you don't. Because it just well, it gets uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm just open arms. What kind of you know? I'm a good yeah, son. I know you are. Yeah. Um, we got Paul Sullivan. Speaking of good sons, he's a good son too. Yes. Uh, he's going to join us. Writer for the Wall Street Journal wrote a uh, a pretty interesting book. It was called The Thin Green Line. Uh, he went and interviewed hundreds of multimillionaires, billionaires, um, and really tried to dive in a little bit deeper of the secrets of wealth. Uh, so it'll be interesting to talk to him to see kind of what was the genesis behind the book. Uh, so stick around. He'll be coming up next. Uh, but what, we have one more on uh, Big yeah, we're, list. we're still rolling on the fatal IRA errors. This is from Ed Slott. And last segment, Joe, we talked about a couple of them. One was uh, the IRA rollover. The 60-day rollover, you can only do one per year for all of your IRAs. So all of your IRAs are considered to be one account. And, and, and by the way... <laughs> <laughs> Siri missed that. Out. Siri missed that. Let me, let me say Siri it again. Siri missed that. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Joe, <laughs> I'm talking. She goes, sorry, I missed that. I don't God, know. You... Just, everyone else is confused. Even <laughs> Siri's confused. Jeez. I, it's a tough crowd, yeah. right? <laughs> Do you have one of those little Echo things? An Echo thing? Yeah, like the what, Amazon Echo? Uh, you, don't, you have no, no idea I, what I, I'm talking I, about? I have, no, I've seen it on commercials, but no, I don't have one. Or you just ask questions? Yeah, well, no, you just, I just say, hey, turn that air conditioning off. I just uh, have Siri. I can ask her anything I want. Well, no, this will turn the lights on, turn the music off. So I, you gave me a good idea. When I'm practicing and getting ready for this program, I should. Yes, because I, you, you. I should, I should, yeah, I practice so much. I should, I should do it in front of Siri and then ask her, did she understand? And I'm sure she's going to say, sorry. sorry. I don't understand. I have no idea. Anyway, I was going to say, Joe, actually I had something good to say, which was this IRA rollover, the 60-day IRA rollover. Uh, this all, all your IRAs are considered to be one. So whether it's an IRA, a Roth IRA, a SEP IRA, or a simple IRA, you can only do one 60-day rollover out of any of those accounts per 365-day year. So there you go. Number two is that non-spouse rollover. If you, if you inherit your parents' For uh, uh, IRA, you can't put it into your own IRA. You have to keep it in an inherited IRA account. And the third mistake, I think this is not widely known, Joe, which is when you have a 401k that has company stock uh, and you roll it over into your IRA, you completely lose a strategy called net unrealized depreciation. I didn't get that. <laughs> Sorry, I don't understand. <laughs> Net unrealized appreciation. That's another thing that's on the chopping block. It is, unfortunately. But it's still there, at least as of as this of broadcast. Yes, uh, as of today. Uh, Friday, or what, Saturday the 14th. Correct. So, um, 
Let's talk about that real briefly, and then uh, we got Paul Sullivan on hold here, so we got to get him off. Yeah, we better be quick on this. But net unrealized appreciation, two, what, a minute and a half and less. Um, okay. It's basically if you have your own company stock, so you work for Sempra, you got Sempra stock inside your 401k plan, all right? There's a strategy where you can take the stock out of your plan and move it into a brokerage account. Why on earth would you want to do that? It's because if you kept it in the plan and you took distributions, let's say you took your dividends and everything else, that's going to be taxed at ordinary income rates, right? Because it's still in the shell of a retirement account. It doesn't matter what type of investments in the retirement account, everything is classified as ordinary income when it comes to distributions. However, if you do have company stock, you can move that into a brokerage account. <clears throat> And then when you sell that stock or take a qualified dividend, now it's taxed at a capital gains rate, which is less than ordinary income. So that's a good deal. That's a huge tax savings for a lot of you. So net unrealized appreciation works like this. Let's say you bought the share of stock for a dollar a share, and it's now trading at $10 a share. You move the stock into a brokerage account. You do have to pay ordinary income tax on the basis. So you bought it for a buck, you pay ordinary income tax on a dollar. But the share price now is $10 a share. So if you decide to sell that share of stock, the $9 of appreciation is taxed at a capital gains rate. So for those of you that have worked for a company for a long time, that have highly appreciated stock inside the 401k plan, absolutely take a look at this strategy before it goes away. Yeah, Joe, and this really comes down to one thing, which is taxes in retirement, because taxes don't stop when your paycheck does. In fact, you'll notice when you start taking money out of your 401k or your IRA, you got to pay regular ordinary income taxes on that. And when you turn 70 and a half, you have to take a required minimum distribution, whether you want to or not. And as you near retirement, tax planning becomes more important than ever. But you must use a forward-thinking tax strategy because actually you have more control over paying taxes in retirement probably than any other time in your life. Find out how you can legally pay fewer taxes than ever before with our personalized tax reduction analysis. And in the analysis, we're going to sit down with you for a couple hours and show you the best strategies for you. It really is different for everybody because everyone has a different situation. We're going to show you how to save money through retirement so you can stretch those dollars and live the retirement lifestyle that you want to. No cost, no obligation. But you do need to call in the next five minutes at 888 994 Six two five seven. That's eight 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 nine nine four six two five seven. All right, we got to take a break. Uh, stick around for Paul Sullivan coming up next. Show's called Your Money Your Wealth. This is Your Money Your Wealth on Talk Radio seven sixty KFMB. Welcome back to the show. Show's called Your Money Your Wealth. Joe Anderson, certified financial planner, Big Al Clopine. He's a CPA. Thanks for tuning in today, Alan. I'm I'm not sure how we got this guest. Yeah, it's uh, but it's pretty exciting. It is very exciting. Paul Sullivan's with us. He writes for Wealth Matters. It's a column in the New York Times, and he wrote a very interesting book. Yeah, called the Thin Green Line. It is phenomenal, and I think a lot of our listeners need to read this book and listen to this interview. Paul, thank you so much. I know you're a busy guy. Thanks for a few minutes of your time. Hey, thanks for asking. I, I, I love chatting, so this is wonderful. Hey, well, well, tell us the genesis of the book, right? It's The Secrets of the Ultra Wealthy. What did you learn, and what are some of the things that we can give a, a couple of nuggets to our listeners? Yeah, it's got this really sexy uh, subtitle, doesn't it? You know, The Money Secrets. But, you know, it applies to everybody. And, uh, you know, that, that subtitle always makes me cringe a bit. It, it's kind of like Axis of Evil. I think it took like 17 people to write those three words. It was sort of the equivalent for that subtitle. But the, the gist of the book is this, is how we think about money matters more than anything else. And it all started when I got invited to uh, participate in this group called Tiger 21. And Tiger 21, they are all super wealthy. They are, you, know, you need 10 million bucks to get into the club, but you know, most people have 50 million, 60 million. They're, they're billionaires in this club. And you would ask yourself, look, if I had $500 million, why do I need to meet once a month and have lunch with a bunch of other guys? to discuss money, right? You think, I'm not going to run out of money. I don't have any concerns. But that's the genius of, of this club. They're there to talk not about you know, how they're going to invest money. They're there to talk about how they're going to think about money. They're going to talk about the decisions they make when they do the only things you can do with money, which is save it, spend it, give it away, or think about it. And being a member you know, for, for one day 
it, it was enlightening for me because, you know, it, I won't give it all away, but put it to you this way. I, I didn't know as much as I, I thought I knew uh, when I was going into that lunch. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. What were some of the things, um, if, if, if there was two or three things that the ultra wealthy do to, or, or just someone that is wealthy, because there's this thin line, right, between, I guess, being rich and wealthy, and the, the, the title's interesting, too. How did you come up with the title? And tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, the title, the thin green line, if you think of the, the S&P 500 or your, you, know, you think of your favorite stock index over the past 50 years, starts low, goes high, but it's not in a straight line. It's a little bumpy along the way. And that's the thin green line. The people who are on top of it, they're wealthy, whether they make a little money or a lot of money. Everybody else, they're, they're rich and poor. So you could be at the very tippity top making a ton of money each year, but you're really rich. And the difference is, is, is freedom. People who are wealthy are able to make all the decisions and choices that they want to make with their money. They're, they're in control. They control life. The people who are rich, you know, in, in the most simplest context, you can think of somebody who is wildly over leveraged. You know, they may make a million dollars a year, uh, but they have, uh, you know, $5 million in, in debt obligations that they're trying to service every year. Life is going to control them. So the, the point, though, is that to be on the right side of the thin green line, to be on that wealthy side, you could be a school teacher. You could be a school teacher who has, you know, listened well, saved her money in the, you know, state-sponsored pension for teachers, saved a little bit of extra, has some, you know, very manageable hobbies, you know, likes to go to church, likes to, you know, go on hikes, maybe take one vacation a year. That person, you know, according to my book and my research, can be far wealthier than, you know, the, the, the corporate titan who's making 500000 800000 a year and is so leveraged that he's, you know, one or two paychecks away from being broke. So wealthy is not necessarily a dollar figure in your bank account. It's basically the control that you have within the wealth that you've created. It's 100 percent. And it's that ability, you know, to, to make those choices you want, whether those choices are you know, to go for a hike uh, with your grandkids or to, uh, you know, hop on a plane and, and jet over to London for a weekend. It's all about having those choices and knowing that, you know, when you make them, you're not endangering some of the essential things in your life. You know, it's funny. Um, Al and I are financial advisors. We sit down with clients quite a bit. And uh, people look at the present and they extrapolate the future like there's not going to be any changes, you know. So that's where we see high leverage, very large incomes, very little savings. And some of the favorite parts of my book was not necessarily like you can learn a couple of ways, right? How people do it right or how people do it wrong. And some of the nightmare stories were, I think, more enjoyable for me. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is, you know, one of the things I learned from, from these, this group, Tiger 21, is they were so aware of risk. They were so aware of things that could go wrong. And, you know, look, in general, would we rather, you know, read about the guy who inherits, you know, $10 million and ends up broke? Sure. It's, it's fascinating. It's utterly fascinating. But to me, it's that person who, you know, earns the 10 million bucks or the 20 million bucks or whatever the dollar amount is, but, you know, 300,000 and finds a way to to make it last and finds a way to do all the things that you know he or she wants in in life that's i mean to me that's a person who's wealthy so so paul uh, so the thin green line so it can go either way you know you can get there but you can lose it and so the, the, some of these wealthy people that you've been talking to, they, they spend a lot of time figuring out how to save it and or how not to have too much risk to lose it. Absolutely. And, you know, what, when you're that wealthy, what, what are you concerned about? I mean, so many of these people are concerned about what's going to happen to their children if their children get that money. You know, are their children going to be able to hang on to that money? Or, you know, they're concerned about, look, if you have that much money, you're like that, you know, 10-point buck in the wild. Everybody wants to come after you and, and, and pitch you something. So how do you make those decisions with your investment so that you know, you're, you're growing your, your, your wealth, but at the same time, you're not taking so much risk? Because why do you need to take risk? If you have you know, 15, 20, 30 million dollars, you know, you know, an, an extra million or two is great, but you, you, you'd rather not lose you know, 10. This is, you know, kind of behavioral finance 101. This is the, you know, the great loss aversion. And so, so much of the thinking is, look, I've been very lucky. Uh, I've gotten to this point. I have a ton of wealth. I'm very successful. Uh, I have a lot of choices in, in life. But I know very well 
that it can all uh, very quickly go away. So how do I protect that? How do I protect it for me, and how do I protect that for, for my family? You, you, you know, you have a, um, a, a unique personal story uh, to, to make your wealth. W- w- give us a little t- tidbits about, uh, about your own personal journey. The, the good part or the bad part? <laughs> <I'll>, uh, <laughs> I guess all the above. Yeah, we'll take you. Well, yeah, you know, I, look, I, I, I say, and, I, and you know, half joking that you know, I'm, I'm probably one of the only people who could have written this book because, you know, I started off in, you know, the bottom 20%. You know, my, my you know, dad went bankrupt. My parents had a lot of problems. You know, my, my house, my, my only, <laughs> it sounds like a Rodney Dangerfield joke, but, you know, my only friend growing up, uh, robbed our house uh, when I was 16 years old, and, and so like wow. if that's not you know when, when I hear my kids complain about bad neighborhoods, I'm like kid, you you don't know what a bad neighborhood was. Um, yeah, and and now we're now we're in the one percent. Now uh, you know uh, you, you, the the either you know much reviled or the, or the much idolized one percent, and it's it's been an interesting journey, but it gives me perspective on you know look it it, it can go away, and you know how do you make sure. It, it doesn't go away, and and more importantly, you know, how do I, you know, talk to my kids, my kids' friends, so they understand, you know, that this is a lot of a lot of it. Look, there's luck involved in everything in life, good luck and bad luck, but a lot of this is is decisions and being aware of the decisions you make, and just as importantly, your 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 behaviors. I mean, no matter how much money you have, you 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 can't have everything, you know. Even if you're Warren Buffett, I mean, look, Warren Buffett, he doesn't even have his own jet. He uses net jets. I mean, that guy's economizing. If he's economizing, you know, we, we all have to make choices. Yeah, you know, that's what we can all learn, no matter, you know, if we're a teacher or, or we're a billionaire. It's choices matter. Yeah, and Paul, I, and I think sometimes even little decisions can make a big difference. 100%. 100% because, you know, it, it's not one gig- – I mean, yeah, I guess sometimes it's one gigantic decision that causes somebody financial ruin. But, but more often, it's a, a series of, of incremental decisions that – add up over time and you look back and it's you know i don't want to pick on people for the spending but the the easiest example is probably that that credit card bill if if you got a, a little balance every month you know 200 bucks a month well what does that become over 12 months well that becomes 2400 bucks you know two years 4800 bucks and it, and it start and, and that's not even with with the interest involved and it starts to grow exponentially and i think that's what people need to be you know, really aware of. Because like I say, you can save money, you can spend money, you can give it away, but most importantly, you can you can think about it. And it's how those four work together that, you know, I hope uh, will allow people to make, you know, better decisions in their own lives. Yeah, I think unfortunately, too, the, the more money that people make, then all of a sudden the more money that they spend because they'll think, hey, I'll continue to make this money. Um, and they don't necessarily, oh, you know, everything can kind of go fairly quickly and so you know you you buy the house and then you do an interest only loan and then you leverage it up instead of paying down more principal and then all of a sudden you know kind of things is a house of cards so just small decisions um i i think it's the key decision here to 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 build the wealth yeah i I joke in my book about something that i call the bordeaux dilemma bordeaux is you know really nice french wine and you know i don't know 20 years or so ago uh I, i tried my first ever you know, Chateau Margaux. Chateau Margaux for wine aficionados, you know, they know it. It's one of the, you know, the, the, the top five Bordeaux. But, you know, entry level price for a bottle of, you know, Chateau Margaux is probably four or five hundred bucks. You know, would I like to have Chateau Margaux every time I have a, a steak when I go out to dinner? Of course I would. But, you know, it adds up. I'd very quickly go broke. You know, if, if you know, once a year my wife and I go out for our anniversary dinner and we splurge and we order our Chateau Margaux, is that okay? Sure, because we're aware of it, and it's a decision that we're making. And at other p- times during the year, you know, the other 364 days of the year, we're making different decisions, and we're not splashing out like that. So, you know, my book is definitely not, and my research is definitely not one of those that says, you know, don't spend your $4 on your Starbucks latte every day. You know, if you don't spend 4 bucks on a Starbucks latte, you will have more money at the end of the year. Now, that's 100% correct. You don't spend that four bucks, you save it, you got more money, but you're also having less fun. It's more about making decisions. If that Starbucks latte is important to you, buy it. But then know that in some other area of your life, you're going to have to sacrifice. Just as, you know, the Chateau Margaux, it's something I like. But if I'm going to have it once a year, there are other decisions I'm going to have to make to offset the splurge for that 
you know, amazing bottle of, of French wine. We're talking to Paul Sullivan, uh, the author of The Thin Green Line. Um, I encourage everyone to get what, – what's the easiest way to get your book, Amazon? Amazon, sure. Come on. You know, the holiday season's coming up. Don't just buy one, buy two. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and where else can they get more information about you, Paul? Go to my website, pauljsullivan.com, or, you know, go to the New York Times website and type in my name, Paul Sullivan. A whole bunch of stuff uh, pops up that you can read over the weekend. All right. Well, hey, I know you're busy. Thank you so much for uh, taking a, a few minutes out of your busy day to join us. Um, it was so fun to talk to you. Thanks, guys. I really loved it. I appreciate it. All right. That's Paul Sullivan, folks. we got to take a break. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. This is Your Money, Your Wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMB. Welcome back to the program. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. My name's Joseph Anderson. I am a board-certified financial planner. I'm with uh, Big Al. He's a CPA. So this is my favorite part of the show, Al. All right. What's that? We got some email questions. Like it. Okay. This is from Advisor Insights, um, Investopedia. Investopedia, full disclosure, Investopedia did give me a free pair of socks. And therefore, you want to read their questions on the air. Well, they send me, Joseph, below our few, here's the latest questions that we've... Um, did you write them and ask them for a pair of socks for me? No. Because I haven't, I, I answer the questions. <laughs> well, <laughs> True. <laughs> Some of them, sometimes they're not accurate, so True. I have to go back and edit. And, and edit the, <laughs> yes. the podcast. Yes. You have to spend hours, hours. editing that. Boy, yes. mm, I'm not so sure about that. Pal. <laughs> so here we go. All right. Um, and these are not from our listeners. They go to this Investopedia. If you do have email questions, Al and I answer them probably within 24 hours. Um, you can ask us anything you want. Uh, you can just go to our website and ask us directly. Most of you can find us. It's, it's funny how they just, the, the, you'll go to our personal email address, which is great. Yeah, that's fine by or, me. Or you can go to info at purefinancial.com or just go to our website. I think it will even say ask an advisor right. or something like that. And that comes to Al and I. Uh, so you'll get uh, right from uh, the horse's mouth. That's right? correct. So um, if you do have a question on anything regarding financial, you get a little free advice there. Okay, so here we go. Um, my employer matches my 401k, but on a monthly payout, if an employee chooses to put the max towards their 401k prior to a 12-month period or tries to participate in catch-up for the last several months of the year, my employer will not match. As an example, I make a higher salary than previous years, but since I am on catch-up this year, was my lowest 401k matching from the company? Do most companies take a monthly approach versus annual in regards to 401k matching? Oh, that's a good question. I, you've talked about that before on the air. And, right. and, and so the, the, the employers will only match while you're putting it in. And, and so in some cases, Joe, what we find is people will put so much into their 401k early on that they didn't get the benefit of the full match. Right. So each dollar that goes into the 401k, the company will match on that dollar. Right, so it depends on the formula that the company uses. Our company, we do dollar for dollar up to the first four percent. So any dollar that goes in, right, we're going to match that dollar, right, up to the first four percent. But let's say this: that um, we, I'm a really good employee, and I got a nice bonus um, in June. Okay, well maybe that bonus, right? I maxed out my 401k plan. I can put, you know, 18 grand in, a full 18,000 went into the plan by June. So I do not contribute into the plan anymore, right? So July, August, thereafter, there's no more dollars going in because I maxed it out by law up to the $18,000. Well, what happened? I missed out on that match moving forward. So you want to you know, map this thing out, if you will, to have your last paycheck max out the 401k. Yeah, but what, what's interesting to me, Joe, mathematically, and I've thought about this, I haven't really taken the time to do the math, but I think by the time you've got 4% in, the, the employer's already matched that 4%, and you should be there regardless of when it actually happens. Right, but it's not true, because it's the, I, I agree with you, but our um, mighty investment gurus you told me, said, no, you got to look at, um, you want to make sure that you contribute to the plan all the way through, because if I don't put money in, right, if you think that, yeah, if, I, if I'm putting 4% in, they're matching me 4%. Right. But if I max it out prior, let's say if I do it all in one year, right, they're not going to 
All in one month. Well, yeah, all in one month. Yeah. I mean, that's Big Al, right? <laughs> Did you know that, that Big I, Al's got a big wallet? Because I make so much. You I can live, do it. I just, you just I max do. out your first paycheck. First, first paycheck. 24 Done. grand. Oh, come on. You got nothing on me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I guess... I guess the point is, uh, yes, there could be some issues there. And I think, Joe, it's probably good advice is to map it out to make sure you're getting full benefit of the match. Okay, next question. Hey, um, I have a beneficiary IRA, Alan, that I doubled by investing in Apple stock. Okay, right. good. I, have, uh, I now have sold 90% of that stock because I felt it was too risky to have all my eggs in one basket. Okay. I would like to primarily live off the interest and not touch the principal. It's $900,000. Okay. How would you suggest I invest to accomplish that? Oh. How should I invest for the long term inside my IRA? Okay. And I guess loaded. I guess we don't we don't know the age. It doesn't, Zero. It doesn't say. So it could be a younger person. Who, who what, knows? a globally diversified portfolio based on your income needs? <laughs> well, <laughs> next I, I So I guess my first response to this, if you agree, Joe, would be um, I, right now, just the, the kind of the old older notion of living off the income, not touching the principal is rather difficult because we're in such a low interest rate environment and dividends are usually only a couple percent. Now, I know there are some higher dividend paying stocks, but the caveat there is a lot of people are chasing them and that, that builds up the price and they're expensive. I would look at this as a, as a more of a total return. I, I would look at a globally diversified portfolio total return not just income and as long as you are let's just say your globally diversified portfolio you're, yes you're earns, not going to be able to get interest to pay your bills depend i mean unless you want to go high yield which is really risky or, or no i mean still it's like okay well let's just round it to a million just so the math's easy okay right maybe he wants forty thousand bucks a year Right. Of income from the portfolio, let's say 4% distribution, right? Sure. Okay, well, where are you going to go to not eat the principal to get 4% on an it's, annual basis? It's difficult. Yeah, it's so, non-existent today. Right. So, so in other words, if you think you're going to, if if you're going to earn six percent on average over the long term, and you take four percent out, then your portfolio is going to grow so that your income will grow. And yes, you may have to sell stocks sometimes. Other times, the stocks will be down, and you'll sell bonds. But the point is that you're keeping your portfolio intact. It's just a little different way than you might have thought of. Here's how I look at this. So let's say that you have a million dollars. You want to take out forty thousand dollars per year from the million dollars. So how should that portfolio look? How should I invest my money? Well, first of all, all right, let's say if you want to pull out $40,000 from the portfolio, I would at least have 10 years of forty thousand of safe money. So short-term bonds, governments, treasuries, tips, things like that. So 10 years, 40,000, that's 400 grand. So 40% of the portfolio would be in bonds, 60% of that portfolio would be in so, stocks. So in other words, no matter what the stock market does, you've got 10 years of really safe money. You can sell off bonds and cover your cash flow needs. The stock market will very, very likely recover in that period of time. Hypothetically, sure. Yes. Right. I well, mean, I mean, we're, we have no way of no. predicting the future, I mean, but th I think that's a good probability. I'll, right. I'll, and all we can do is look at history. And there was really only one period of time where that was maybe suspect, and that was the Great Depression depression in the 1930s. Right. And then you can look at the Great Recession, right? The last decade. Well, if you had all your money in the S&P, you lost money in that 10-year time period. But if you were globally diversified with real estate commodities, oil and gas, small cap, large cap, international merging markets, and everything in between, right? Well, you, your portfolio probably did okay over that 10-year time period. Sure. So you just got to look at this logically. We're not living in, you know, 1980s, you know, where, where interest rates are double digit, where you can just buy a CD and get your five, six, Seven percent. Yeah, I remember. Gosh, I think it was 1980, Joe. 1981. My dad said, "I just got a CD at the bank for with 15 percent interest rate." Now back to your money, your wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMB. Hey, this is it, Big Al. Made it through another um, episode. We sure did. What what episode number is this? Who knows? <laughs> Two <laughs> for 2017. Second one this year. 2017. Yeah. 2017 2. Um, we're answering email questions, and uh, let's. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm not going to waste any time. I'm going to get dive right in. This is a, kind of an interesting uh, question we got here. Okay. Should I diversify between different financial institutions? Okay. As a high net worth individual, should I diversify between um, two institutions such as Wells Fargo and Chase, or should I just diversify within one of those organizations? Okay, that is a good question because. Everyone hears not to 
put all your eggs in one basket, right? And diversification is good. But to me, Joe, this is this is a little bit like uh, going to a grocery store. And here in San Diego, next to my home, there's a Vons and there's a Ralph's. And it's like they've got the same stuff. And it doesn't it doesn't really matter which store you go to. They've got they've got the same stuff. And so, the same price. Yeah, the same price generally. I mean, there might be a few exceptions, but it, by and large, it's it's very similar. And if if Vons is close to my house and Ralph's is not, well, why would I go to Ralph's? There's there's no particular advantage for me to go there, right? And in the same way, I think when you have two institutions like this, Wells Fargo. Uh, uh, and what was the other one? Chase, Chase J.P. Morgan. Yeah, Chase. I wrote down charge. Uh, uh, church? No. Charge. I mean, <laughs> it, it could be Vanguard. It could be Fidelity. Yeah. It could be TD Ameritrade. It could be Schwab. It could be Merrill. It could be whatever. I mean, th- those are broker dealers, right? You go and buy a stock. The stock is going to be trading at the price of that. You know, So if I buy it through Chase, if I buy it through Schwab, roughly I'm going to get the same price. Now, what, what the different pr- uh, price is going to be maybe the the vig or the, the the commission that you know that company makes or the broker makes and things like that. It, it could be, and I, and I think it's from a simplicity standpoint, you'd rather be all in one place so you could monitor your investments better. But what about this question, Joe? Which is, well, wait a minute. What if uh, what if Chase or Wells Fargo goes, goes out of business? Right. right? Well, it's different. You're investing in a security versus a a bank. Where it's like, okay, well, yeah, I mean, there's FDIC insurance because you're giving your money to a bank. Banks are lending your money out, right? When you give your money to a bank, it's not in the vault. It's, in, you know, they lend it out to someone else in a form of a mortgage in most cases, right. right? And then what happens? Wall Street takes those mortgages and then sells them on Wall Street. Yeah. Right back, full hence, circle. Hence the Great Recession. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which, believe me, that's not bad in and of itself. It's just that there were abuses that helped cause this. <laughs> yeah. So when you're looking at a bank, yeah, you want to diversify between banks. If you're a high net worth individual, let's say you got several million dollars and you want all CDs, well, yeah, you you want to go to the FDIC insured limit on that particular then, bank because the if the one. bank goes down, right, right, that's something different. Uh, I mean, if Wells Fargo goes down, which they should, I mean, that's just another show. Oh boy, <laughs> you're really out there now on your soapbox. Okay. <laughs> Explain yourself. <laughs> well, I don't know. Next thing I know, I got fifteen credit cards, and I didn't. Even, I thought I had one. <laughs> Charged for each one. You got eighteen accounts now. Yeah, I got. I didn't know I had eighteen <laughs> accounts. I was wondering why my credit was so bad. Um, anyway, whatever. I don't. Know. <laughs> but uh, I mean, if Wells Fargo goes, goes down, J.P. Morgan will buy Wells Fargo. Yeah. So your money's still invested in the like Apple stock. So if I if I buy Apple stock through Wells Fargo versus J.P. Morgan, what, well, I mean, what's and, the difference? And, and even if J.P. Morgan doesn't buy it, it's the the your assets are separate from Wells Fargo. So yeah. Well, well you got to worry about the cash. That's I mean, if you're in securities, you own that security. You're an owner of that particular company. They're just a broker dealer of it. They're just brokering the trade. Right. You're not going to Apple to buy Apple stock. You're buying it from someone else. And so what these companies do, they broker the trade. That's all. It, I mean, it's pretty simple if you look at it like that. So if Wells goes down or JP goes down, Fidelity goes, whatever, right, you just have to worry about the cash positions because then that's where, you know, a lot of these banks make a ton of money is on the bank and the lending and everything else. So that's what I would be more concerned with, not necessarily in, in the likely, well, who knows, right? Lehman went down, Bear went down, who, Wells probably go down. I don't know. Well, that's, but that's where that comes from. Sure. And, uh, and those were investment banks. And then so it's when the, different, you know, sure. the Fed stepped in and then they made them. Yeah, we got all these regulations, which, but now we're rolling back regulations. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. I, me personally, I'm not concerned whether I have all my money at one place uh, versus another. Uh, just because of the way everything is structured, if, if that institution goes down, you, the, the investments are still there. It's it's they're safe. Yeah, and I, I yeah. So whatever. I'll, I'll die. Uh, uh, next question. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, let's see. What tax rate will my mother have to pay on a cashed out IRA? Summary. Okay. I have a terminally ill mother who is 69 years old. She has a traditional IRA worth 500k that she converted to an annuity of 4%. Her medical uh, care requires increased cash flow to pay day-to-day bills. The company has agreed to cash out the full value of the IRA with zero surrender fees. Okay. The company will not transfer the IRA to any other investment vehicle. If she takes the cash value, what are the tax implications? 
Her income last year was $30,000, and her effective combined federal and tax rate was, what, 3%. Will she pay 3% on the 500000 or the full federal and state rate of 41%? He's in North Carolina. Okay. All right. Well, there's a lot of things there's there. There's a lot of meat there, yeah, huh, there's, for a couple there's minutes. There's a lot. Three minutes. Okay. Well, I guess let's start with the annuity. First of all, if you, if you cash out an annuity and, uh, and, the, and the company is allowing you to do that without surrender, it can still stay inside of an yeah, IRA. Yeah, that's where I'm confused. Did you pull it out of the IRA to buy the annuity, or did the or did they buy the annuity in the IRA? Right. I mean, if they buy... <laughs> yeah, I guess we could answer both questions. My presumption from listening to the question was that she bought it inside Inside the IRA, so I read she, the question. I so, didn't even so, understand. So that she, so that she had a four percent guaranteed return. So if that's the case, then you surrender the the annuity inside your IRA. There is no taxes to pay. You only pay taxes on what you withdraw. And so mom needs more than thirty thousand per year. Great, just get a little bit more. By the way, it's uh, when you when you have effective rates like three percent, that would be an average rate divided. You take your total tax divided by total income. When you add additional income, now you're on the marginal rate uh, concept, which means whatever tax bracket you're currently in, like be it fifteen percent or 25%, whatever it may be, that's actually the tax that you'll pay on the additional income until you hit the next bracket, and maybe some of that will be taxed on the higher amount. So it'll definitely be a higher tax, depending upon what she withdraws. If she if she takes out $500,000, let us just go down that path for Right, a so he's thinking, okay, well, last year, her rate, or effective rate, so that's the amount of tax that you pay inside, um, dividing your gross income, was 3%. Okay, and so it's like, all right. Well, last year her effective rate was three percent. So she takes out the five hundred thousand. So she 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 pays three percent on the five hundred yeah, grand. Absolutely not. Five hundred thousand single taxpayer maximum bracket thirty nine point six federal and whatever North Carolina's tax rate is six. Six. Yeah. Okay. So we'll call it forty six percent. Forty five percent. Forty six percent. Yeah, something like that is so, is not all of it will be taxed at that rate, but a bunch of it will. So okay, th- tell me this: she's terminally ill. She yep. takes the money out, five hundred grand. Okay, right out of the IRA. She dies before April next year. Who pays the tax? Uh, she her she does on her final return. She's dead. Yeah, but money's she, gone. I know, but <laughs> right. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. She spent it. It's gone. She she spent. She it. gave it to Junior here. Yeah. Well, IRS cannot come after uh, kids for the tax liability. So I think the, the, they they left hold, they'd be left holding the bag on that one. So. Your advice for terminally ill people is just to cash out your. Well, they there would have to be a look back if they cash that out. Let's say they gave it to the kid, they hmm. would look for where that money went for sure. Oh sure, I, I, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm not an attorney, so I don't know their the exact rights or not, but that would seem logical. Well, what the hell are you then? I'm a CPA. <laughs> oh okay, <laughs> but on the other hand, if in fact Joe that they. Um, they, she spent it all, right? And then if, I suppose that's a strategy. If you know you're going to die by April 15th of next year, you spend it all, and then you're scot-free, right? <laughs> no. Do Keep it in the IRA. Buy the annuity because then you get the 4% distribution. Now, be careful with that to make sure that is it life only, right? If you're going to annuitize it, yeah. is it life only? Or maybe you do a 10-year, 20-year period certain where that, that, that money will continue to pay out to your beneficiaries. So let's say, all right, well, I got $500,000. I'm going to ca- uh, create income of $20,000 per year. Well, make sure that you do a period certain on that because if I'm terminally ill, maybe I got 12 months to live. Well, I'm not going to, unless I spend the full $500,000, uh, the likelihood of that is probably l- low. You probably want to still give some to the heirs. So sure, right. um, just be careful. With anything like that, um, always consult a true professional, uh, not us. So, <laughs> That's someone else. <laughs> so, yes. so, all right, we got to go. We're running late. We blew up the clock. Go to purefinancial.com if you want more information. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll be back again next week. For Big L Clopine, I'm Joe Anderson. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth.